Good morning. In yesterday's lecture, we were discussing the evolution of a disturbance in an elastic medium, an elastic rod, let us say. And the kind of disturbance that we were discussing, we had a deformation of the rod and we considered the situation where the deformation, uh, we studied the evolution of the deformation in the same direction as the deformation itself. And we had obtained an equation which governs the evolution of uh, disturbances in an elastic rod. So, the disturbance was xi, the variable xi represents the displacement of any element of the elastic material and these displacements are along the x axis and we had assumed that the displacements also vary only along the x axis. So, the xi is a function of x, the only variable, only spatial variable that xi is a function of is x and it is a function of t also. And we had obtained this differential equation, this partial differential equation which governs the evolution of xi and this partial differential equation we had written in this fashion where we had this constant C s which was the square root of the Young's modulus divided by the density of the elastic medium. And I had told you that this equation is, is the wave equation. <coughs> If you have a disturbance which uh, can propagate which, which is which varies in all three directions, then you have to replace which varies in all three directions, then you have to replace the derivative with respect to y with the Laplacian operator that is del del x square plus del del y square plus del del z square and the wave equation is now given by this. Now, I should tell you the first uh, the first thing that i should tell you is that the waves which we had considered in the last class are what are known as longitudinal waves so the waves that we had considered in the last class are what are known as long u longi sorry longitudinal waves What do we mean by longitudinal waves? A wave is said to be longitudinal if the disturbance, is so if the disturbance, so that in this case the disturbance is along the x axis, the displacement of any elast any point in the elastic medium xi is along the x axis and xi itself varies along the x axis. So, such a wave is uh, said to be a longitudinal wave. Uh, you could also have another kind of wave called a transverse wave. Let me give you an example of a transverse wave. If we have a stretched string, so think of this line as a string which has been pulled tight it is stretched and if in this string we inter introduce a disturbance which is perpendicular to the direction of the string let us say that I plug the string like this and leave it then the evolution of this disturbance is uh, this disturbance is a transverse disturbance it is uh, this disturbance is going to move around along the x direction and if I use the same symbol xi to denote the disturbance the disturbance is perpendicular to the direction in which the wave can propagate. So, this is called a transverse wave. Another situation where we have a transverse wave is the electromagnetic wave. And I have already told you that for an electromagnetic wave, if I have uh, electromagnetic wave is a disturbance in the electric and magnetic field 
and if this is a disturbance in the electric field then if I have a wave which is propagating in this direction the electric field disturbance can only be in the directions perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is propagating this too is a transverse wave the electric field and the magnetic field both have to be perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is propagating. So, if the wave is going along the x axis which is the situation that we, we have been discussing the electric field can be anywhere in the y z plane. So, both of these are transverse waves. So, we have different kinds of waves possible we have longitudinal waves possible we derived the wave equation for a longitudinal wave which is disturbances in an elastic medium longitudinal disturbances in an elastic medium, but you could also have transverse waves like the uh, disturbances in a string. Now, in all such situations the evolution of the disturbance is typically governed by such a wave equation. So, the wave equation that we have derived is very general it does not hold just it is not that it holds just for the elastic waves it holds in a such an equation arises in a large variety of situations. So, if you analyze the evolution of the disturbance in the string or if you analyze the evolution of the disturbances in the electromagnetic field in all situations you will find that the disturbance is governed the evolution of the disturbance is governed by such a wave equation. The only difference that occurs when I go from one kind of wave to another the main difference that occurs is that the speed at which the wave propagates the phase velocity of the wave that changes. So, for an elastic wave we found that the phase velocity of the wave is related to the properties of the elastic medium which is the Young's modulus divided by the density. If I have some other kind of wave uh, if I have wave disturbances in a stre stretched string then this phase velocity is the square root of the tension per unit length of so this will be replaced by the tension divided by the unit the mass per unit length of the string for an electromagnetic wave it is uh, the, 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 the speed at which uh, speed of light in vacuum and so forth. So, depending on the particular wave that you are considering the, the value of this constant the value of the phase velocity will be different, but usually the wave is you will find that the wave is governed by an equation like this. So, this kind of an equation is a very general equation and it arises in a large uh, variety of uh, situations. So, it is very important to understand the solutions of the wave equation which is what we are going to discuss in today's lecture. Now, I have already also told you that <coughs> that the sinusoidal plane wave which we have discussed at great length earlier on in this course the sinusoidal plane wave which can be mathematically expressed like this. I have shown you that the sinusoidal plane wave is indeed a solution to this wave equation. So, this is indeed a solution to the wave equation provided the wave number k the wave number corresponding to this wave vector and the angular frequency are related in this fashion. So, the relation between the angular velocity and the wave number is called the dispersion relation. So, provided the angular velocity and the wave number satisfy the dispersion relation corresponding to this particular wave. So, the dispersion relation for this particular wave will have the phase velocity the constant c which occurs here appearing in the dispersion relation. So, provided omega and k are related like this then this is a solution to this wave equation. So, we have already seen one particular solution a special solution to the wave equation. Now, let us discuss a few a more general kind of a solution of the wave equation. So, <coughs> the first kind of solution that we shall discuss is called a plane wave solution. So, let us discuss a plane wave plane wave solution of the wave equation. what do we mean by a plane wave solution? We are going to assume that xi the disturbance which in general could be a function of 
all three spatial variables x, y, z, we are going to assume that it depends on only a single spatial variable. It dip, so, the xi, the, dis, the disturbance varies only in a particular direction and we will use x to denote that direction. So, we will assume that xi, the disturbance that we are whose evolution we are studying could be the longitudinal disturbances in, a, in an elastic rod, could be the transverse dis vibrations of a string, whatever it be we will assume that it depends only on x not on y and z. Now, if xi if the disturbance depends only on x let me draw the x y z coordinate system. This is x, this is y and this is z. Uh, rather let me put it other way around this is z and this is y. So, we have a right handed coordinate system and if you impose the condition that xi depends only on x, then you see that the value of xi is a constant on a plane which is per parallel to the y z plane. So, it is constant on this plane it will be constant on this plane also, it will have a different value on these two planes. So, xi if it is a function of x alone will be constant on this plane, it will be constant on this plane. The value of xi could be different here and here and it will be different on every other plane in between. Since the value of xi is constant on planes, this is referred to as a plane wave solution. So, that is the first point which you should note. So, when we mean when we speak of a plane wave solution what we mean is that the value of xi is constant on planes and in this case the planes are perpendicular to the y z plane. If instead of x I had chosen y then the planes would be perpendicular to the x z plane and so forth. So, in this situation when xi is a function of x alone the wave equation that we have to deal with is uh, is this it is uh, you have the second partial derivative with respect to x of xi minus 1 by c square. Now, please note that I am going to use c without the subscript x to denote the speed of <coughs> the phase velocity of the wave. So, I am not going to put the s explicitly in all of today's lecture. So, you should you should realize that the c which is here is not necessarily the speed of light, it is the speed of light in vacuum when we refer to an electromagnetic wave. In when you are dealing with an elastic wave, c is the speed the phase velocity of the in the elastic medium which is the square root of y by rho etcetera. So, c is the phase velocity of that particular wave not necessarily the speed of light in vacuum it is the same as this C s just that I am not going to show this s explicitly. So, the wave equation is this minus 1 by c square del by del the partial derivative of with respect to t this is equal to 0. Xi is a function of x and t and we are looking for solutions to this equation. <coughs> It is convenient to introduce two new variables w 1 which is x plus c t and w 2 x minus c t. So, xi now is a function of w 1 and w 2. We can replace these two variables x and t position and time with the two new variables w 1 and w 2. So, we have to also now replace the derivatives with respect to x with derivatives in terms of w 1 and w 2. So, let me work out the derivative of with respect to x in terms of derivatives with respect to w 1 and w 2. So, del del x is equal to del w 1 
So, the derivative with respect to x, the partial derivative with respect to x, you can express in terms of part partial derivatives with respect to w1 and w2 using the chain rule of differentiation. And so, you have to now calculate these derivatives, the derivative of w1 with respect to x, the derivative of w2 with respect to x. So, let us go back to our expression for w1. If you differentiate this with respect to x, you get 1. Similarly, if you take the partial derivative of this with respect to x, you get 1. So, you find that this is equal to this. So, the derivative with respect to x can be written in terms of derivatives with respect to w1 and w2 like this. Now, let us also work out the derivatives with respect to t. So, the quantity which is convenient to deal with is 1 by c partial derivative with respect to t. Again, we will do the same thing. So, I will put a 1 by c here del w1 del t del del w1 plus 1 by c w2 del t so we have now what we are doing is we are expressing the derivative with respect to t the partial derivative with respect to t in terms of partial derivatives with respect to the new variables w1 and w2 so we have to calculate this partial derivative first. So, what happens when I differentiate this with respect to t and divide by c, I get plus 1. If I differentiate this with respect to t and divide by c, I will get minus 1. So, <coughs> we see that this is equal to So, we have worked out the derivative with respect to x and t in terms of derivatives with respect to the new variables w1 and w2. Let us now go back to our wave equation. So, this is the wave equation we are we originally started with. In this wave equation, we have to now replace derivative with respect to x in terms of the derivative with respect to w1 and w2. You also have to replace derivatives with respect to t in terms of derivatives with respect to w1 and w2. So, we have to square this. So, when you replace, <coughs> let me do it for you explicitly instead of uh, it, it's quite straightforward. So, the derivative with respect to x, the equation that we get is the derivative with respect to x squared. So, we have partial derivative with respect to w1 plus partial derivative with respect to w2 that is the derivative with respect to x the square of this acting on xi. So, I have written down the first term over here the square of this operator that is the partial derivative with respect to x this acting on xi and then I have to subtract out this. So, I have to subtract out let me uh, <coughs> have to. So, I have to subtract out del w1 minus the partial derivative with respect to w2 square into xi this is equal to 0. The, this is the equation this is the same wave equation. So, what we have done is we have written this wave equation in terms of derivatives with respect to w1 and w2 this is the derivative with respect to x which has been written like this this is the derivative with respect to t divided by c square the second derivative which I have written in this fashion. So, the same diff wave equation is now this equation over here in terms of w 1 and w 2. Now, when I expand out the first term let me expand out the first term. So, the when I expand out the first term what I get is partial derivative with respect to w 1 the square of this plus 2 times partial derivative with respect to w1 and w2 which is the cross term between this and this plus the square of the second term this whole thing acting on xi minus now when I square this I will have I 
I will get the same thing as this, but with an extra minus sign because there is a minus sign over here. So, I will have minus 2 del square plus this acting on xi is equal to 0. Now, when you add these two terms, there is a relative minus sign here. So, this will cancel out with this, this will cancel out with this and you are left with the equation, the equation that you are left with. Let me, uh, <coughs> so the equation that you are left with is that the second derivative of xi, which is a function of w 1 and w 2 with respect to w 1, this is equal to 0. So, what we have done is we have uh, <coughs> changed variables, we started off with xi as a function of x and t, we have changed variables, gone over to two new variables w 1 and w 2 and we have written the wave equation in terms of these two new two, two new variables and this is the equation that we get. We have to now look for solutions to this equation. Now, you see that this equation, this, the finding the solutions to this equation is much simpler. Uh, you can guess the solutions to this equation, much simpler than the original equation that we had. And there are three possibilities you can straight away think of. The first possibility is if xi uh, w 1, w 2 is a constant, but this possibility does not give us a propagating disturbance, it is not a wave. So, it is not a, not a very interesting solution, though it is a, a mathematically permissible solution. The second possibility, which is interesting now, is a situation where xi is a function, some arbitrary function of w 1 alone. So, if, if xi is a function of w 1 alone, the function should be differentiable and we would like the function to vanish at infinity plus minus infinity otherwise there is no other restriction. So, if I, if we choose xi to be a function of w 1 alone, then when you put this here, the derivative with respect to w 2 is 0. So, this equation is satisfied. So, this is you see this gives you a particular a possible solution to this equation and you have another possible solution, which is a situation where xi is some other function f 2 of w 2 alone. So, if we have some arbitrary function of w 1 alone or some arbitrary function of w 2 alone, then both of these are solutions to the wave equation. So, let us go back uh, to the variables uh, which we started out with. So, what we see is that the solution to the wave equation can be written in the following way it could be some arbitrary function f 1 of w 1 and w 1 is x plus c t plus some other arbitrary function f 2 of w 2 which is x minus c t. And this combination linear superposition of two such functions is a solution to the uh, to this wave equation which for which you are trying to find a solution. So, we have obtained the most general uh, plane wave solution to the wave equation, plan, planar solution to the wave equation. Now, let us uh, interpret uh, this solution. Uh, let us first uh, focus on a situation where uh, we have only the first function. So, we have only let us focus on this particular solution, let us set this to be 0 and let us focus on this particular solution. So, at t equal to 0, let us plot this function f 1 could be some arbitrary function which is differentiable and we would like it to vanish uh, far away. So, let me plot some such function, you could choose any function that you wish. So, I will ask you to uh, plot a function of your choice, I will plot a function of my choice. So, let me plot a function. So, the function that I will plot looks let looks something like this. So, at t equal to 0, the function looks like this. So, this is f 1 
x which is xi at t equal to 0 we have only this we do not have this part we are not considering this part we are only considering this part. So, xi at t equal to 0 xi is f 1 x which looks like this some arbitrary you could choose some other function uh, which you prefer for your uh, of your choice and draw it. So, now we have drawn xi at t equal to 0 now let us ask the question what will xi look like at t equal to 1. Let us ask the question that xi has a particular value f 1 0 at this point at t equal to 0. Where will xi have the same value at the time t equal to 1? So, at t equal to 1 we have to make the argument of this function the same as x as the as 0 we have to make the argument of this function 0. So, what you see is that the argument of the function becomes 0 at the point x is equal to minus c at the time t equal to 1 the argument of this function of becomes 0 when x is equal to minus c. So, this kind of an argument applies to all the points. So, what you can say is that the whole function at the time t equal to 1 the whole function has shifted by the amount c the whole function has shifted to the left side. So, the whole function has shifted by an amount x equal to minus c that is what happens as time evolves. So, at time t equal to 1 the whole function has shifted. So, you have exactly the same thing repeated, but it is now all shifted by an amount which is equal to c at t equal to 1 the whole thing has shifted by an amount c to the left. At t equal to 2 so at t equal to 2 if you ask the question where has where is the value of xi the same as the value at as as it was at this point at t equal to 0. So, you want to make the argument of this function 0 at the instant t equal to 2. So, this is going to happen at x is equal to minus 2 c. So, what you see is that the at t equal to 2 the whole curve has shifted by minus 2 c. So, it has shifted to the left by 2 c. So, at t equal to 2 the same curve is going to be the, the value it go, is going to be the same curve the value of xi is going to be def, def, described by the same curve. All that has happened is that the thing the curve has shifted by an amount 2 c to the left. So, this so what we see is that this part of the solution represents a wave propagating to the left at the speed c. Let me repeat again we have determined a general solution to the wave equation and the general solution we found is a sum of two parts. The first part is some arbitrary function of x plus c t the second part is some arbitrary function of x minus c t. We have been interpreting the inter the significance of the first part which is some arbitrary function of x plus c t and what we saw was that this corresponds to a wave propagating to the left with the speed c. So, the functional form of xi does not change all that happens is that it shifts keeps on shifting to the left. So, this picture over here uh, shows you the evolution of the left propagating plane wave solution. So, this is the solution at t equal to 0 at t equal to 1 the whole solution has shifted to the left and at t equal to 2 it has shifted further to the left the shift being. So, from here to here the shift is going to be c from here to here the shift is going to be 2 c and at t equal to 3 it would have shifted 3 c this shows you an animation of the left propagating plane wave. So, this and it moves keeps on moving as time evolves. So, let me show you this again. So, as time evolves this is xi at t equal to 0 at t equal to 0 xi is the function f x 
f 1 x in this case and then at as time evolves the whole pattern moves to the left with the speed c which is what you see here. So, <coughs> this part of the solution represents a wave propagating to the left, it is a left propagating wave. Now, you could ask the same question what does this part of the solution represent and it is quite clear what this part of the solution represents f 2 again could be some arbitrary function and as time evolves so at t equal to 0 the xi x let us forget about this and focus only on this at t equal to 0 xi x is f 2 x as time evolves the whole pattern now propagates to the right with the speed c which is what you can this picture shows you. So, we have f 2 which is some other function some arbitrary function of x this is the functional form at t equal to 0 as time evolves. So, this is the whole thing shifts to the right. So, this is the functional form of xi at t equal to 1 and this is the functional form of xi at t equal to 2. So, this shows you an animation of how a right propagating plane wave evolves. So, this shows you xi as a function of x at t equal to 0 it is described by a function f 2 x at t equal to 1, 2, 3 the whole thing keeps on shifting as time evolves and it shifts forward in x with the same speed c. So, let me just recapitulate what we have done we wanted to look for solutions of the wave equation the disturbance the wave disturbance xi could in principle be a function of all three spatial coordinates x y z. We restricted our attention to a particular situation where xi depends on only one spatial coordinate and we chose it to be x. So, xi is constant on planes perpendicular to the x axis this is called a plane wave and we found solutions to the plane wave equation to the wave equation and we found that there are two kinds of solutions possible. The first kind of a solution is could it could be some arbitrary function of x plus c t this represents a wave propagating to the left or it could be some other arbitrary function of x minus c t which represents a wave propagating to the right and in general the any arbitrary solution could be a linear superposition of two such functions. Now, <coughs> the plane wave the sinusoidal plane wave uh, which we have discussed extensively earlier the sinusoidal plane wave the, in purely real notation can be represented like this a sin omega t minus k x this is a sinusoidal plane wave which we are already quite familiar with. Now, let us check that the sinusoidal plane wave is a special case of this solution. So, to show you that all that we have to do is we have to choose f the function f 2 to be a sin x. So, with that choice, so I have set f 2 to be a sin x. So, with this choice sin x into k x. So, let me write it here f 2 I have chosen f 2 to be a sin k x then the solution xi with this choice of f 2 the solution xi is going to be f 2 of the function of x minus c t. So, it will be a k x minus c t which we see is exactly the same as this. 
provided we identify <coughs> uh, I could put a minus sign here so this will be minus and I have minus here so we this is exactly the same as this this represents a left propagating wave and all that you have to do is you have to identify omega the angular frequency with k into the speed c. So, what we see is that the sinusoidal plane wave which we have been discussing is a particular example of a plane wave solution where the function is a, is a sine, but you could have a much more general solution and any arbitrary function provided it vanishes far away vanishes at infinity and uh, or it is well behaved at infinity need not vanish sin x does not vanish. So, provided the function is well behaved at infinity and it is differentiable then uh, we could it could be a solution right. So, this is a very special solution where this is a sine function, but in principle it could be any arbitrary function provided it is well behaved at infinity well behaved everywhere and it is differentiable everywhere. So, these were the plane wave solutions to the wave equation. Now, let us we will discuss another kind of uh, solution today. So, the other kind of solution that we are going to discuss is what is called a spherical wave solution. So, the, the, the next kind of solution that we are going to discuss spherical wave. So, we are looking for solutions to the wave equation. So, let me show you the wave equation again. We are looking for solutions to the wave equation. This is the wave equation and xi could be a function of all three spatial variables x, y, z and time. Now, we are again going to impose a certain symmetry. The plane wave solution comes when you impose a planar symmetry we are again going to in impose a symmetry we are going to assume that xi depends only on the distance from the origin. So, we have chosen a particular coordinate system x y z and this is the origin of the coordinate system we will assume that the wave that we that we have a situation where the value of the wave disturbance depends only on the distance r from the origin. So, this is the distance r from the origin we will assume that xi depends only on this. So, xi has constant value on spheres centered on the origin. So, the value of xi is the same on this. Xi will have a different value on this sphere, but it will be same all over the sphere. So, depending on the radius of the sphere, xi will have a different value. So, we are assuming that xi depends only on the distance from some fixed point, which is the origin. So, this is the value of xi is constant on spheres. So, that is why it is called a spherical wave solution, spherical wave. Now, I am sure you are familiar with the Carti with the polar spherical polar coordinate system. So, the spherical polar coordinate system has three variables r, theta and phi. Instead of using the Cartesian coordinates x, y and z, it is equally possible to equally well describe this whole space all points in the space using a spherical polar coordinate system r theta and phi. So, you could suppose we are using a spherical polar coordinate system. So, we do not have x y we are not using x y z we are using r theta and phi. The question now is that we have to represent the Laplacian operator 
the Laplacian operator you know is uh, the sum of partial derivatives. So, the Laplacian operator is the second partial derivative with respect to x plus the second derivative with respect to y plus the second derivative with respect to z. So, the Laplacian operator is this sum, it has derivatives with respect to x, y, z. When you go over to this spherical polar coordinate system r theta and phi, you have to represent this Laplacian operator in terms of derivatives not in terms of x y of x y and z, but derivatives in ter of with respect to r theta and phi. So, briefly you have to now write down x y and z in terms of r theta phi and then transform these expressions just like we wrote it in terms of w 1 and w 2. You have to use the chain rule of differentiation and write this in terms of derivatives with respect to this. Now, I shall not go through the algebra, it is a little tedious and lengthy. So, I shall not go through, through the algebra, but the point is that it is possible to write down the Laplacian in terms of the, the polar spherical polar coordinate system and you will have terms involving derivatives of r, derivatives of theta and derivatives of phi. Now, the equation which we are trying to solve is this, the Laplacian of xi minus 1 by c square time derivative of xi. So, so, when you have the Laplacian acting on xi, remember that xi is been assumed to be a function of r alone. So, when the Laplacian acts on xi, the derivatives with respect to theta and derivatives with respect to phi are not going to matter it is only the terms involving derivatives with respect to r which are going to be important. So, I can write down the Laplacian, the point is that I can write down this in the spherical polar coordinate system and if in general the Laplacian in the spherical polar coordinate system will have derivatives with respect to r derivatives with respect to theta and derivatives with respect to phi, you can get the expression in any book on mathematical physics or any book let us say on electrodynamics. Uh, but the point here is that the derivatives with respect to theta and phi are not going to be important because we are assuming that xi does not depend on theta and phi, it depends on r alone. Theta and phi refer to different points on the sphere, we have assumed that xi has a constant value on the sphere. So, it is only the r derivatives that we have to retain, we can ignore the theta and phi derivatives in the Laplacian and if you retain only the r derivative, the Laplacian is 1 by r square del del r partial derivative with respect to r, r square partial derivative with respect to r of xi. So, this is the Laplacian written in the spherical polar coordinate system. So, you have derivatives not of x, y, z, but with respect to r, theta and phi and we have dropped the terms involving derivatives with respect to theta and phi. So, this is what the Laplacian operator acting on xi becomes. Now, we replace this in the wave equation. So, the wave equation now reads as follows. So, for a spherical wave, the wave equation now becomes 1 by r square partial derivative with respect to r and then I have r square partial derivative with respect to r xi minus 1 by c square partial derivative with respect to t square of xi, this is equal to 0. We are looking for solutions to this equation, xi is a function of r and t. Now, it is convenient to introduce a new variable here. So, xi is a function of r and t, it is convenient to introduce a new variable u which is also a function of r and t such that xi is equal to u divided by r. <coughs> so, with this new function, introducing this new function, 
uh, we have to differentiate this once with respect to r. So, let me do it here 1 by r partial derivative with respect to r and then I have r square and let me write down the derivative of xi with respect to r. So, I will have one term which is the derivative of u divided by r. and I will have one term which is the derivative of r. So, I am going to get u divided by r square. This is the first derivative of xi, this minus the term over here, which I am not going to write down explicitly again, I am just indicating it. Okay, so, this is the same time derivative term which here, which is here. Just that you have to replace xi in terms of u. Now, you can simplify this term. So, what will happen is that this factor of 1 by r. So, let me write it here 1 by r and I have r into del u del r minus u that is what we have minus again the time derivative, I am just carrying it unchanged is equal to 0. <coughs> so, this is the same thing as this. Now, we have to differentiate it with respect to r again. Notice that if when I act on this, I will get two terms. One term is the derivative of r into, so which is 1. So, one term is going to be del u del r, which is exactly going to cancel out with the term that I get when I differentiate this. <coughs> So, there is only finally one term which remains which is r into the second derivative of u. So, we can now write down the same equation here. So, what we have is 1 by r square and r into the second derivative of u. So, this is the what you get from this whole term over here and I have to also write down this term over here replacing xi with u by r. So, r 1 by r comes out and what I have is minus 1 by c square 1 by r del u del t square is equal to 0 and the factor of 1 by r gets cancelled out and finally, what we have is del u del r square minus 1 by c square del square u del t square is equal to 0. So, what you see is that u the way new variable u which you have introduced satisfies exactly the same wave equation the same one dimensional wave equation which we have just solved earlier and we have seen that there are going to be two solutions. So, I can straight away write down the solutions for u, u as a function of r and t is going to be a sum of two solutions the first part is f 1 r plus c t plus f 2 r minus c t. We have already studied the solution to this wave equation, which is what I have written down here. And then I can straight away write down xi as a function of r and t. This is going to be f 1 r plus c t divided by r plus f 2 r minus c t divided by r. <coughs> so, we have worked out the spherical wave solutions and uh, again we see that the spherical wave solutions are a sum of two parts that it could be some arbitrary function f 1 well behaved arbitrary function uh, <coughs> whose derivatives are also defined of r plus c t divided by r plus some other arbitrary function of r minus c t divided by r. So, we have two possible solutions. Now, remember that r is if this is the origin, r is the radial coordinate. So, r, r changes in this direction. So, as you go from this sphere to this sphere, the value of r increases. So, for a plane wave, these two solutions corresponded to left and right propagating waves. In this particular case, just see as t increases, 
the value of r has to go down if you want if you are following the point where f has a certain value where this has a certain value the value of r has to go down so this represents a wave which is propagating inwards so the first part represents a wave which is propagating inwards that is decreasing r the second part represents a wave which is propagating outwards that is increasing r now a point to note here is that as the wave propagates inwards or outwards its amplitude changes as 1 by r so if you have an outward propagating wave outward means as time increases r increases if you have an outward propagating wave this represents an outward propagating wave as time increases the wave goes in this way r the value of r increases and as the wave propagates outward its amplitude falls as 1 by r okay so let me show you an outward propagating wave over here so the value of the wave has a fixed value on this sphere at some time at a later time that same value has shifted out but it has the amplitude has fallen by 1 by r and then at a later time the whole thing is again shifted out the amplitude falls again as 1 by r so, and the amplitude keeps on falling as 1 by r okay so this is an outward propagating wave and if you want to see an inward propagating wave this shows you an inward prop propagating wave now we could ask the question in what context do we have outward and inward propagating waves now <coughs> if i had a point source from which there is some wave coming out so there is a source which is localized at a point and there is some wave coming out from that well this could be represented using uh, the outward spheric going spherical solution so this will represent such a solution so if i have a source located at the center over here so let me show you this so if i had a source located at the center uh, if i had a source located at the center over here and there was a wave coming out from this the evolution of the wave uh, would be described by an outward going wave so as time evolves the wave wave would get evolved into larger and larger spheres like this and the amplitude would fall as 1 by r or if you ask the question how does the intensity fall the intensity would fall as the amplitude in the intensity goes as the square of the amplitude so the intensity would fall as 1 by r square so this is the outward propagating wave the inward propagating wave there is it also is has applications suppose i send light through a lens which focuses the light to a point then once the light comes out from the lens i can represent it by a spherical wave and that spherical wave is going to slowly that sphere is going to slowly contract it's an inward going wave the intensity of the light is going to go up and at the focus it's going to go to infinity okay and then the light is going to go through the focus so the light is going towards the focus and then it's going to go through the focus and it's going to come out so the inward going wave is going to collapse and then it's going to come out as an outward going wave okay so in today's lecture we have uh, determined we have uh, discussed uh, solutions of the wave equation the wave equation itself is very general it ap appears in a large variety of situations and in today's lecture we have discussed two kinds of solution two particular kinds of solution the first solution applies in a situation when we have planar symmetry it the wave depends only on one spatial direction plane wave we have plane waves and the second solution that we considered we have spherical symmetry so it you can apply it to a situation where you have waves coming out from a source if you are sufficiently far away from the source this is a point which i uh, you should remember that if you are sufficiently far away from the source sufficiently far away from this source so when the wave becomes quite large you can you can represent this quite well using a plane so a spherical wave sufficiently far away can be well approximated by a plane wave and uh, we have studied only two kinds of solutions there are a variety of other solutions possible in different situations we could have a cylindrical solution and whatever you could impose different kinds of symmetries and get different kinds of 
solution. So, we shall end our uh, lecture here today and uh, move on to something new in the 